we're going to have to rebuild within this wild, wild west of information flow some sort of curating function. It's time for the Access of Easy podcast, the weekly technology digest that keeps you ahead of the curve. We've got to maybe do something with the internet. Brought to you by EasyDNS.com. Somebody will say, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. These are foolish people. UK COVID-19 contact tracing data is being harvested and sold. Canadian Heritage Minister questions the morality of posting news articles to social media. The Canadian military accidentally runs a PSYOP against its own population. And big tech efforts to squelch the Hunter Biden expose backfires big time. Hey everybody, this is Mark Cheftovic with another episode of the Axis of Easy Weekly Digest. This is episode number 168, recording this on October 19th, 2020. That means the show notes for this edition would be at axisofeasy.com slash 168. And let's do the quotes. Last week's was, when a population becomes distracted by trivia, when cultural life is redefined as a perpetual round of entertainments, when serious public conversation becomes a form of baby talk, when in short people become an audience and their public business a vaudeville act, then a nation finds itself at risk. Culture death is a clear possibility. That was the late Neil Postman author of Amusing Ourselves to Death, and the winner this week was M.C. Schultz. This week's quote is, minimal exposure to the media should be a guiding principle for someone involved in decision-making under uncertainty. You know the rules, no searching this up online. The first person to post the correct source of the quote to the show notes page gets their next hosting or domain renewal on us. UK COVID-19 contact tracing data being harvested and sold. Legal experts in the UK are now warning of an impending privacy crisis after a study from that country's The Times paper found that track and trace data being collected at bars and restaurants to fulfill their COVID-19 tracking obligations is being sold off to marketers, credit reporting, and insurance companies. The problem arises not from the official NHS contact tracing app that mandates that data collected by businesses be retained for 21 days and only be used for test and trace, but private solutions have entered the space, such as QR code service called PubTrack and Trace PubTT. It charges pubs a small monthly fee to collect patron contact data for their NHS track and trace obligations, but they also bury additional terms in the fine print of the app, such as, quote, to make suggestions and recommendations to you about goods and services that may be of interest to you and shared with third parties, including service providers or regulatory bodies providing fraud prevention services or credit back background checks, end quote. So they also sell your data to third-party services, and they retain it for far longer than the 21 days directed by the NHS. Another example is a company called Ordamo, and they explicitly stipulate in their terms of service a 25-year data retention. So right now, the NHS is investigating the practices of 15 companies running these kinds of business models, and we will see what happens there. Canadian Heritage Minister questions the morality of posting news articles to social media. Canada's Heritage Minister Stephen Gilboult, or however you pronounce his name, has called posting news articles to social media platforms immoral, even when those articles have been posted by the news outlets themselves. The remarks come as he pushes forward with plans to institute some kind of mandatory licensing scheme, which would see big tech platforms such as Facebook and Twitter pay link fees to Canadian media outlets. And here in Canada, they are colloquially known as approved media. While Gilbult described the social media platforms as poaching the content from the media sites and accusing them of reprinting entire articles, U of T law professor, no, I'm sorry, University of Ottawa law professor Michael Geist has an article that shows, and every normal person already knows this, that only a small preview of the articles are typically posted. 
and more importantly that most of the engagement is driven by links that the media companies are posting themselves earlier this year if you remember gilbolt endorsed the recommendations of canada's broadband legislative telecom review the btlr which we reviewed in depth back in the day we also created that petition in the house of commons to try and make sure that the federal government rejected it in its entirety it also called for all content creators to have to obtain a license from the government in order to carry out their activities all that said i think the biggest content poacher of them all as we revealed in the very first issue of access of easy when we called it the WTF Weekly for only one episode is Google when they scrape out the answers to typical questions frequently asked via the search engine and they display the answer in line in the search results instead of the link to the source website and entire website businesses were destroyed once Google started doing that and that practice has never really been called out. How companies game Google for local services ads. I, I sort of knew this was happening for a few years because I had a neighbor up the street who owned a plumbing company and he used to tell me how his business was being impacted by what he called the Google Wars. So a CBC marketplace piece looks at how companies game local business listings algos in the Google Maps to pull in customers by passing themselves off as a local company near the prospect. So they use shell companies, fake websites, locally targeted phone numbers, PO boxes, and they erect numerous false front local businesses you know, local in air quotes, in multiple cities and even neighborhoods. And that, that way they can get into the top results whenever consumers search for vendors nearby. CBC's Marketplace did a similar expose last year and found the same kind of thing going on within the locksmith industry. New EU ad tracking and consent model falls short of GDPR requirements. With the advent of Europe's general data protection rules, the GDPR, the online ad tech industry has been scrambling to somehow keep their cake while complying with the new rules. And that's why, you know, every website you go to these days has some pop up in your face with a bunch of legalese and then a checkbox that just says, I agree. And hopefully once they get you to click that, they've successfully CYA themselves. But maybe not, especially in Europe, where IAB Europe, which is the ad tech industry's policy response body, came out with their transparency and consent framework, TCF, a little after the GDPR came out and it was designed to address the EU market specifically. An EU data supervisor in the form of the Belgian DPA undertook a review and they found that the TCF, quote, fails to meet the required legal standards of data protection, end quote. The investigation was launched in response to complaints around the use of personal data in the real-time bidding component of ad tech networks. GDPR upset a lot of Apple carts here in the domain world where easy DNS operates. The big impact was the destruction of the Whois database ecosystem as we know it, and the industry is still lurching toward RDAP as the next generation of domain lookups. I actually saw something on the registrar policy list today that maybe ICANN is going to be running a centralized RDAP service instead of the registrars running their own version. So, I mean, we still don't know how this is going to play out, and this is a few years into it. Microsoft Windows 10 takes over PC, reboots it, installs unwanted apps. We've covered this before. I think it was, let me see, Access of Easy 156, how Microsoft Windows 10 installs certain software components on your box, whether you want it to or not, how their Chromium Edge browser tries to automatically set itself as your default browser and how it cannot be uninstalled. So as widely speculated, Microsoft is now using these uninstallable Edge browsers to install so-called progressive web apps, PWAs, which are web-based versions of the company's signature software applications like Microsoft Office. In fact, this is kind of funny, the Verge columnist that we link to here, Sean Hollister, uh, 
was writing an article about this exact thing before he stepped away for dinner. When he got back to his computer, it had rebooted itself and done exactly this to him. Quote, when my machine finished rebooting, it now contained the exact thing I'd been writing about before I was rudely interrupted. Microsoft had installed unsolicited, unwanted web app versions of Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and Outlook onto my computer, end quote. And the update also took the liberty of adding shortcuts for these unwanted apps to his start menu. I'm just glad I haven't used Windows in about 20 years. Canadian military accidentally runs PSYOP against Nova Scotia residents. So if you're in Nova Scotia and you've gotten those letters, official looking government notices warning you to beware of roving packs of wolves that were accidentally introduced to the area by the Department of Land and Fisheries. You can ignore that, even if you've heard the sounds of wolves howling in the forest. That's just an information warfare unit within the Canadian Armed Forces fucking with your heads by mistake. The letter was a forgery, and the howling sounds in the forest? Those were recordings of wolves being played over speakers placed in the woods. According to the National Post, it was a unit called the 36th Canadian Brigade Group, CBG, who were running a training exercise to practice the conduct of psychological warfare operations against civilian populations. Apparently, it was all a mistake, and they're not supposed to run psychological warfare operations against their own population. Kind of reminds me of that movie, Will Smith and Gene Hackman, Enemy of the State. It's, it, was, it anticipated this surveillance society thing very well. And at the end of it, when they catch, you know, the bad guys go down and, and the, the good cops sweep in and pick everybody up, including the corrupt NSA people, they're telling their story and the NSA guys are saying, oh, we thought the whole thing was an STO, a standard training operation. Anyway, that's just what this reminded me of. Big tech efforts to squelch Hunter Biden expose backfires big time. Okay, so I know we're in the home stretch to the most contentious election in U.S. history. Believe me when I'm telling you I'm not covering this piece to be political for one side or the other. As a Canadian and a small government libertarian, I don't really have a horse in this race. The libertarians always lose all times. Anyway, what I'm interested about in this story is what I said in my book, Unassailable, about how deplatforming simply doesn't work. It just invokes the Streisand effect, and whatever it is you're trying to push down just gets a boost in the other direction. We have a textbook case of it this week. The New York Post released an expose apparently about Hunter Biden's uh, laptop that was left in a repair shop and had scandalous materials on it. I'm not even going to comment on it. I haven't even read the New York Post piece, to be honest. But what happened is Facebook and Twitter really went full out to try and dampen the spread of this expose. Twitter went as far as to prevent everyone on the platform from sharing the link to the article. And they even went into the NY Post Twitter account and deleted the original tweets about the expose. This, of course, causes a huge backlash, and people are sharing this thing all over to the point where Twitter had to back down and reverse its policy. It was a stunning reversal, really. And now a U.S. Senate committee is asking the heads of Twitter and Facebook and Google to come talk to them about big tech media bias. As far as I can tell, the leaders of those companies have refused to accept that invitation. But it just shows you how futile this is and the best thing that any of these platforms could have done was to just let it run and, and in the email version i might as well say the quote here too in the email version of access of easy i quoted my own book sorry i'm talking up my own book a lot of these tech platforms seem to think it's incumbent upon them to judge what is in the mind of others, the intent of others, the possible outcome of other people's actions, not to mention that when they do, they are frequently, in essence, adjudicating international law. All I or my company or any company can competently assess is what is happening on our respective platforms, nothing else, end quote. And what I meant by that latter part was that all we can really do is police spam 
and malware and network abuse. That is it. We can't really game out what's going on in the mind of others, whether something is authenticated or not authenticated. It's not our job to do that. Our job is to run a clean system that everyone can access under the same terms across the political spectrum. And if you think that big tech and the media isn't biased, play this thought experiment. What if the New York Post expose came out exactly the same in all details, except it, instead of Hunter Biden, it was Eric Trump or Don Jr. Do you really think Twitter would have done the same thing or Facebook would have done the same thing? I don't think anybody can honestly tell themselves that that's how it would have happened. Anyhow, if that wasn't exasperating enough, I did kind of lose it last week when an online dictionary changed the definition of a word after a purely manufactured outrage. Again, U.S. election coming down the home stretch. We've got these SCOTUS hearings, so it's even more contentious. It's perceived to be the most important hearing ever for obvious reasons. I get that. So what happened was Senator Hirono, who's a Democrat from Hawaii, took issue with Amy Barrett Coney's use of the phrase sexual preference, which is a completely innocuous and benign phrase used by countless luminaries, including those on the left, including Joe Biden, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and hitherto completely uncontroversial. But Hirono claimed that the phrase was offensive and outdated, and within hours of saying that, Twitter lights up with the new battle. I'm sure all of the left of center blue checks were frantically scrubbing their timelines, removing all instances of the word sexual preference. On its own, that would be okay. Tiresome, but all right. But what really got me was what happened next was the Merriam-Webster Dictionary changed the meaning of the word preference adding that, quote, the term preference as used to refer to sexual orientation is widely considered offensive, end quote. So I found this not only exasperating and unhinged, but also chilling in its ramifications. I wrote up a piece about it over on my Out of the Cave blog. I guess I should tag on a language alert for it as well, because I, I, I was pissed when I wrote that piece. So, and you'll probably get that when you read it, if you read it. So last week on the Axis of Easy, we had Jesse Hirsch asking, can the digital divide be bridged? And he also took a look at the industry of selling surveillance tech to other nation states, while Charles Hugh Smith wrote about our simulacrum economy, as well as how we have institutionalized incompetence. And then on the salon, number 26, the three of us got together for our weekly salon. Actually, was it 26? It was 26. Then on the salon, the three of us got together and we had the honor and the pleasure of welcoming the the one, the only Dr. Ben Hunt of Epsilon Theory onto the show to talk about the role of narrative and a lot of other things. It was a great conversation. We had a great time and we'd love to do it again sometime, but tune it in, check it out. It was a phenomenal show. The show notes for this week's edition, again, accessofeasy.com slash 168. And uh, I always say, stay safe, stay sane, stay healthy. And I mean all of those things. But as we get into the home stretch to this election and it's polarized and it's contentious. Just remember you're dealing with your friends and your colleagues and your families, and you have a wonderful, great country with a lot of accomplishments, a lot of issues that it's grappled with and tried to overcome. And it will continue to grapple with and overcome in the future. Don't let this tear you apart. Everybody take a breath calm down, realize you don't agree on everything, and let the process work itself out. And just entertain the notion that the person you're looking at across the aisle on the other side of whatever political spectrum you're on may not be a subhuman demon. They might actually be a person just like you and try and bear that in mind over the next few weeks okay take it easy everyone we'll see you next week it's
Oh, 